Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me today. I'm Nikki Ryberg, and I'm here to present Rock Your Resume today. Um, a couple housekeeping things. Bear with me. My allergies are driving me crazy today. I had to stop on my way into work to get some allergy medication. They're so bad. And um, ironically, I'm from Oregon, and that's where I live, but I am working out of a co-working space in Green Bay today because after this, I have to take my kiddo to a hockey tournament. Um, so you have to love um, um, modern technology that I was able to find a conference room at the last minute. Um, so I'm really excited to present on this topic today. Um, so we're gonna dig right in. I have some slides, I have a lot of handouts. Um, everything that we go over today, um, later this weekend, I will send it to the library and they'll go ahead and distribute it to all of you because all of this has been donated by me. Um, I really hope that this is like a hands-on workshop and all of you leave with some helpful things. Um, so with that, let's get started. Um, so I definitely want to encourage you to use the chat feature throughout. When I'm finished, I'm going to go back and kind of scroll through those to make sure that I address as much as I can. Um, but I also don't want to get distracted while I'm talking too much. So don't feel like I'm ignoring you. So before we dig in, I think it's helpful to know about my background and like where I'm coming from with some of my advice and feedback today. So a little bit about me. I have about 15 years of HR leadership experience. I had a lot of hiring and a lot of recruiting experience. And like many people, I just got burnt out. It just wasn't really a fit for me any longer as my kids got a little older and out of like the daycare stage. We just felt like we were still running in a lot of different directions. And my husband has a pretty demanding job. He's a trial attorney and we we don't have family in the area. So I quit with no plan. Um, I wish I would have had like a career coach or someone to talk to, um, but things for me luckily worked out. Um, Basically, I started helping some folks with their resumes and that led to doing resume writing and then that led to career coaching. And so what does that mean exactly? And like, how does one, you know, validate if they're good at that or not? Um, so for starters, I do have a master's degree in HR. So when I say I know a lot about HR, um, I legit went to school for it. My undergrad and my graduate degree are in that. And then I also worked in that field for 15 years. When I decided to pursue the resume writing, I actually got my certified professional resume writer certification. I didn't know this was a thing either. So if any of you are out there like, what, really? Um, yeah, I found it on Google. Um, I thought I knew a lot about resumes um, from being in HR, but honestly, I, I really didn't. Um, I would read about things and look at books, but that certification really helped me. And then with that, what I kept finding was that a lot of my clients were in the same boat that I was in and like they weren't happy. They knew they needed a change, but they didn't really know what was next. And so that led to me um, through some network connections, finding out that actually UW-Madison has a really great course. Um, geared towards um, folks that are pursuing careers, like service positions, and want a career helping those with their careers. So through that, I got it, my Global Career Development Facilitator certification, which is essentially like I call it a fancy way of saying career coaching. And then this past summer, I also got a certification. Um, it says certified digital career strategist for those of you who are like, what the heck is that? LinkedIn. <laughs> I kept hearing a lot about LinkedIn. So I went back for that as well. So all of this today comes from the lens of tying all of these different things together and is really coming from a pretty modern approach. Um, and so that's a little bit about me. I work as a career coach and resume writer. I help clients all over the US and Canada. And I think I mentioned in the beginning, I do live in Oregon, Wisconsin. Um, we moved there about two and a half years ago and we just love it. So a resume. Um, the first thing I want to say about resumes is that less is more. Having um, your space and the real estate that you choose to use on that piece of paper is really important. Um, so you want results. That is a way that you create a resume that really rocks. So some examples like do you use numbers? Do you provide context? Do you have proof of things? Um, do you offer solutions that you've done in the past and really showcase things that are uniquely you and that make you stand out? Or is it more focused on tasks or job duties and very generic or lacking substance? So what I mean by less is more is if you have a resume that looks like a ginormous job description, that is not really what recruiters or hiring managers are looking to see. And it won't help you stand out in a stack of competitive candidates. 
And so that sounds great or sounds super vague, depending on how much knowledge you have on these topics. So today I really want to dig in and show you some visuals and give you some examples on ways to do that. So before we start, I think it's helpful to kind of think about the look and feel of a resume. But before we even do that, one thing we really need to talk about is what is an applicant tracking system? For probably most of you that are, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of my face so I can see my screen a little better. For most of you that may be thinking about applying for jobs, you may have heard something about the ATS or the robot or keywords and things like that. There's all sorts of gurus out there that will tell you they're an expert on these systems. Oftentimes they're trying to sell you things, um, which is fine. Like a lot of businesses are trying to sell you things, but you don't need to be quite as scared of those as some of them may make you feel. It's essentially like a computer database. So like when I worked in HR, one of the companies I worked at, we implemented an ATS. It was where we posted our jobs. From there, it would post it to places like Indeed or Glassdoor. And when people applied, it would store it in that database so that we could go in and see, okay, we've had like 60 candidates between all these different job boards. And if we wanted to, let's say we were fortunate that we had too many candidates, like we had 2000 candidates for this great job we had. Well, there's no time to look through 2000 candidates. So through the ATS, maybe you could say, I just wanna look at based on the job description and kind of what we're looking for and that key criteria of what we need, show me like the top 25% of the candidates that applied. So this computer system is essentially using artificial intelligence based on keywords, based on like different criteria that you may have inserted, maybe a bachelor's degree was required. Like for instance, let's say due to state licensing, you had to have an RN for this position. So it would go ahead and automatically take out anyone who didn't meet the minimum requirements. So those are the sort of things we're talking about in terms of a robot reading your resume. And it is important to know about that. And we're going to talk about some things later as this presentation goes on, on some tips on ways to stand out for the ATS. But I just don't want people to get too like worked up on what those are and like thinking that that's the only thing you need to worry about with your resume. Because ultimately, your goal is still to really look strong through a networking connection, or if you make it to the hiring manager, you still really want to stand out on paper and results still really matter. So I think it's really helpful to start with template or design ideas because resumes have really changed even from when I did them just like six years ago versus now. They're very, very different. Um, part of that is due to the ATS. If you have something that has too many graphics or too many images or too many different things going on, the ATS will not like that as much. There is some truth to that. Um, so if you've heard some things like that, I definitely agree with that. And frankly, it makes sense. It's like anything in life. If you're uploading it to the software system, it is important to keep in mind what the parameters of that system are, but they're all different. Every single system out there is different. You probably know this from applying. Sometimes you have to like go in and rekey in everything you just did on your resume. Other times it just takes it. It depends on the coding. It depends on all of the different things going on and you can't control it. So rather than like worry too much on that, just try and go with something that is more ATS friendly. So I have two websites here that I really strongly recommend. Um, they both factor in the applicant tracking system and they both have really good modern templates um, that really help you stand out on paper. So the first one that we'll click on is called livecareer.com. I really like this website because it actually lets you take your information, like let's say you have an existing resume and you want like a new template and you don't want to spend the time to retype it and all of the stuff that goes into that, it's so much work. You can take your existing one and pick a template within this system and you'll have like a newer template. So if we click for instance on resume examples, let's just click view all. This gives you a feel. Okay, now it's making me choose a position. We're just gonna choose accounting. It's fine. It doesn't really matter which one it is. This shows you some visuals of very ATS friendly resumes, very user friendly resumes, and they look sharp. 
Like they're a little better than the average resume you may put together in Word. They're still fairly simple, but oftentimes that's the right direction to go. Um, I wanna show you another one that I really like. I'm gonna go ahead and close out of that, which is, this is called Distinctive Web. All of the resume templates that I go ahead and donate from today's session are actually from this site. So I'm gonna go ahead and log into my account here quick if it, there we go. One sec, I just gotta get in there so you guys can see what I mean. My internet's slightly slower than when I'm talking. While there you're we go. logging in, we do have yeah. a question from Allison. Okay. Said, would you recommend more than one resume, one more visual for handing out, and one with more keywords, et cetera, that would go through the ATS? That's a good question. I'm going to save that for the end um, because I think once they see what all goes into these, my answer will make more sense. So I hope that helps. Just hang on there. Short answer try and stay with one because it's going to be a lot less work for you because as I start to talk about tweaking them and tips for how to do that, far easier to be tweaking one. Um, and short answer, I hate images. A few are okay, a few are good. You get into too many, it gets bounced by the ATS and your time is far better spent networking than it is like having four different versions of your resume going out there. That said, um, if you have very different job targets, then you'll probably want one or two, but we can get into that a little more in the end. Um, so this site is called Distinctive Career Services. The link will be in the presentation notes that are sent to you later. And basically it was created by a professional resume writer. So she offers resume writing services. Um, I've never utilized hers. I pay for a premium subscription for access to her templates. And we are going to get into some of her templates later. I just wanna go ahead and show you the site, but let me show you how different her templates are versus some of the ones we were looking at on Live Career. This is just one example. And again, we'll get into all of these later. Um, but you can see it's a lot more colorful. There's a few more things going on. It really pops well on paper. I'm not a huge fan of the colors, but what I really like about her site is you can go on and like easily change fonts. You can easily change colors. And that's why I really like this site because it's so user-friendly. And for example, a lot of folks will jump on Canva and try and do a resume there, it's a terrible use of real estate. You remember how in the beginning I said less is more? You'll notice here, there's still a lot of white space. There's still a lot of like, it's not too crowded, it's not too cluttered. And so I find that these resumes in particular, it's really easy to go in and tweak things or if you wanna add a section or move some things around. Unlike some of the ones on Canva where it's super hard to do that unless you work exactly within their space parameters, or I've gone um, onto Etsy or similar websites and have purchased ones that graphic designers have done. They've all just not allowed me to have quite the flexibility and freedom that I liked as a writer. So I think the ones that this firm offers are really good. And so I'll have four to donate at the end of this. So if one of them happens to work for you, great. If they don't, I can tell you like to purchase just one template is like 25 bucks maybe. And for the time it saves you from like designing the stuff on your own, if you needed to go that route, it's totally worth it. And it's also a bargain because to go somewhere else would probably cost quite a bit of money on someone else's site. So with that, it just gives you like a general look and feel. Um, so now you know what an ATS is. You have a couple sites you can go to um, if you need a template. Sorry about that. Got ahead of myself. Oh, goodness. My mouse is a little sensitive here. Um, so it's important to do that. But that said, if you're already getting some phone calls from your resume or you already have one that you're working with and you're happy with it or you spent a lot of time on it, chill out. Like, it's okay. Do not feel like leaving the session. Oh my gosh, the thing wrong with my resume right now is I need this new template and I need to start over from scratch. Like, not at all the case. Like, if people are looking at it and they're like, no, this looks good. I can guarantee there's probably results or there's probably some language you could do on there or ways to like stand out in terms of formatting or using bolding, but don't feel the need to completely start over from scratch. 
But if you're not having any success or you are like starting from zero and you're not sure where to start, these are a really easy way to kind of have that place to start from so you don't spend too much time spent like spinning your wheels. Um, and it's good to know that they're ATS friendly and then also um, content and results still matter the most. So I just wanna make sure we covered everything here. Um, ATS, we covered the site, so now you'll know where to go find those. Um, it's important to relax if you feel like, hey, I, didn't, I don't have these fancy ones. And ultimately content still matters. And this entire process, I wanna remind you is helpful for your interview preparation. I get a lot of folks that are like, oh, this is so much work. I don't wanna do it. Can't someone just do it for me? They can, like folks like me offer that. Um, at least I used to now, I focus primarily on coaching, but there's always someone out there that's willing to take something off your plate. But I'll warn you, they're going to either do some lengthy questionnaires with you, or there's a lot of forms you have to fill out because it's ultimately still your career, your goals, your background, all the things. So you really do need to have kind of some investment and ownership in this process, because once the resume gets you to the point of the interview, you need to be prepared to talk about these things. And it's equally important in the interview to have more of a results focused interview, because that's what they're judging you on. Um, so let's go ahead and move forward. I have a resume cheat sheet. I'll pull it up quickly. We're going to refer back and forth to it quite a bit throughout the rest of the presentation today. And you'll also have access to it afterwards. So I just want to let you know that as best I could, I put all of this information into kind of one visual cheat sheet, which oh, I'm trying to, I want to bring it up so I can maximize the screen here. There we go. This I did, oh, it's probably been about three years now. So you'll notice that it doesn't really match like the look and feel of maybe some of the templates I just showed you. I did this manually in Word. And so you can do that. Um, you can really get creative with your formatting and, and not need a fancy template. But I have visuals within this resume cheat sheet to really help you figure out what to include and how to stand out. So we'll refer back to those in a little bit. So I just kind of wanted to also let everyone know like everything we talk about today as best I can. I have some tools and templates to help you because I can make this stuff sound easy. I do it all day. But when you go back to sit down at your desk later, you may feel like oh, Nikki made this sound so easy, but now I'm kind of spinning again. Um, these things should help because you can go back and refer to them. Okay, so the most important piece of your resume to me is the summary and introductory section. So a lot of the writing experts will tell you that the top one third of it is really the most important. You want the best and most important stuff there. Why? Well, because that's where they look first. Like the first thing, like let's say somebody was applying to be like a nanny. The first thing you're kind of looking at on that resume is like, do they have any childcare experience? Or if they're applying to be an accountant, like, do they have their CPA? Like the things that you know a job requires and needs, you really want on the top one third of your resume. And so it should also focus on both where you've been, but where you're going. Oftentimes, one of the mistakes I see with resumes is they're too focused on where someone has been. And a lot of folks are either pivoting or trying to up level or trying to re-enter the workforce, or there's there's some something going on that's you know, cause them to be looking for something different. We want to also focus that top one third of the resume as much on where they're going as where they've been. So really highlighting like the relevant skills or keywords or soft skills that they have that they know those positions are looking for. So it's really important to do your homework and help identify what do these positions need what do I have to offer that they're looking for? And am I marketing that to them on the top one third of my resume? That alone will really help improve your interview success requests. Um, it's a great area to have like key areas of talent, top accomplishments. Like let's say your top five most proud things you've ever done in your career combined. Those could go right at the top, especially if there's numbers involved. So I wanna look at some template examples for ways to do this or how to market it. And again, you'll have access to all of these later. Um, and another key piece to keep in mind is it's true that the average reader looks at this for six to eight seconds. I've seen some coaches out there right now arguing, oh no, this isn't the case, or we as recruiters 
spend our time looking at this. They may, if let's say they're bringing you in for an interview or if the VP handed them your resume because you networked with them and they speak highly of you. But for the average like person, there's a lot of resumes floating around out there. The average recruiter or hiring manager there's just a lot of things going on. So they're going to give it that quick, like, okay, I don't know, does this look decent look? And then if they really are interested, then they might start to read the finer print, even within the interview, it may even be after the interview that they really start to look at it. So it's really your job to help market that resume, knowing that I need to pass that like first glance test. So everything you do, you kind of want to hold your resume up and think, does it pass that six to eight seconds? Kind of like the elevator speech they talk about um, in job interviews. You wanna have some things on there that really grab their attention quickly and think about how you organize it. All right, so summary sections, what do we include? Well, let's start with that cheat sheet. Um, some things here. One thing that's really changed in resumes is it used to start with an objective statement. Please don't do that. That's considered a really dated practice nowadays. Um, and that's something you kind of saw more in the 90s or even early 2000s. You want to start with more of a summary of where you've been, but also where you're going. And then on this one, you'll see that I provided some key talents and expertise. That's a really good way to start, but let's go back to some of the other examples um, from the Distinctive Career Services site. So for instance, I wanna pull up I'm gonna pull up this one. Their summary section does a really good job of some of the things I'm kind of talking about. Right away, what's your area of expertise? You're highlighting the two things that you know that job needs right here, right at the top. And then you're talking about it again in a headline and then you're getting into it even more. So you can already see the difference between this versus in the 90s and early 2000s with the objective statement. It's really going more after marketing and branding yourself to their needs and how you can solve the employer's needs versus just kind of this, you know, I'm seeking a position in administrative assistant. Very different. Um, and then right here, they use bullets right away in the beginning to talk about major accomplishments or qualifications. So this would be a great section to have your top four things you're most proud of ever in your career at a variety of positions. You put it right front and center, like here's the things I did, here's some numbers to prove it. This is really getting their interest on paper right away. And then they did a great job here of if you know there's a certain credential they need or something they're looking for, you can see how it's formatted to really be bold and stand out. And then they're offering um, right here, key value offerings. Again, getting into, I don't know, essentially a bullet. And you can see how now they're skimming it. You can see how different things stand out. So that's a really good way to focus on having that top one third of your resume stand out. This may seem easy if you have a lot of things to work with. Um, when we first got on the chat today, I noticed a few people said, you know, I'm just kind of re-entering the workforce or different things like that. Well, maybe this isn't the right format for you. Maybe there's a different way we can do that to still stand out on the top one third. So let's pick a totally different example. We'll go ahead and minimize those and pick out more of like an entry level template. I think this is the one I did in the beginning. This one is really focused um, on someone who maybe just graduated. So you can see how they kind of have the branding statement, a couple of key things, but then it jumps right to education. I really would only recommend that order for a, a recent grad that doesn't have a lot of internship experience. So let's bring up a different document to show you what else I mean. Ah, this one too goes in that same order. I wanna go for the third here. So this is kind of a fun one. It's still kind of similar to the one um, before in terms of what if I don't have a lot to work with? Well, that's where I'll challenge you. These key qualifications and keywords could be focused on soft skills or talents that you have, such as like detail orientation, organizational skills. Maybe you helped do social media for um, your child's like club, club team. And so maybe you're looking for marketing positions. There's still ways you can weave in things 
that are more recent or relevant to the positions you're looking for without necessarily having done them in a job. So those would be the types of things I'd focus on. And I would still look for that in terms of success. Like oftentimes um, folks that are re-entering the workforce have a lot more to work with than they may think. I had a client who was in charge of her school's fundraiser and she could speak to the growth that that fundraiser had year over year, the three years she was in charge. Um, so that would be something that you could absolutely put as a key strength here. And you just want to think about how would that be relevant to the positions I'm applying to? Maybe they're not fundraising positions. Well, do they want organizational skills or do they want someone that's strong at marketing or someone that's strong at operations and kind of tying all of the things in? Those are the sort of things you can still put on the top of your resume without necessarily having done them for paid work. And if you don't have anything like that, um, you can still focus more on some of the soft skills and you can also think about, are there some things you can get involved with in the meantime to get some things like that to put on your resume? So oftentimes if I have clients that are like, well, I know I wanna you know, return to the workforce when my youngest graduates high school, that's when my child support runs out. Um, do you have some tips for me? I would say, you know, get involved in some things now so you can start to think about those sort of accomplishments to have on your resume. So it's all just a matter of people's individual circumstances, but essentially, it is really important to have this top section really market towards where you've been, where you're going, and you're acknowledging that you've identified some of the things they need in those roles and that you do a good job of marketing your ability to meet those needs. So we're going to go ahead and go back to the presentation here. Let me minimize these quick. I do have a question on the yeah. chat, which is how does one tie the summary to a job ad? Um, and then also just kind of a comment about having seen mixed things about summaries. So like, how do you make sure you do it really well? Okay, so the first question, how do you market it towards the job ad? You want to have as many relevant keywords that they talk about. So for instance, let me go back to kind of my resume cheat sheet because I'm a, a visual person here. Um, and I think that that can help. So I'm gonna pull that up. And if you were looking, for instance, for a paralegal position, I would expect this section to talk about, you know, ability to write briefs, ability to, you know, do calendar coordination. This key stuff in here would all be things that more than likely they ask for in their job ad. So you really want to research their job ad and look closely and have those highlighted here. This would not be if you were going for a paralegal job, the area to talk about social media for your kids club team or all of these other random things. It's like the things they ask for prior prioritization, organizational skills, strong writing skills like research abilities. So you really, in some cases, you want to use their language as best you can as it's relevant. Um, so that should answer the first question. Can you ask me the second one again? I forgot it. Uh, yes, it was. Um, I've heard mixed things about including a summary. I have seen these not done well. Um, how does one use it effectively? Um, I, I would. Yeah, I've. I definitely think people need a summary because if you just jump right to professional experience or education or something like that, you're missing the ability to market toward to the employer that you have what they need. So the best way to do it is through these examples. Like for instance, this one, um, you would give one or two sentences to describe yourself in high level detail in terms of like what they're looking for in their position. Um, insert some keywords, and then maybe kind of talk about where you're going next. So for instance, I wonder if I have another visual. Um, I'm not sure that quite addresses it for them. You'd need to spend some time here. You really need to look at what those job ads need and using this type of visual to figure out what's the best way you can insert those things. And again, I would challenge you to say, well, go back to the elevator pitch example. If you had the opportunity to be on the elevator with the hiring manager and describe yourself in 45 seconds or less why you should get that job, why you would be really good at it, and why they should consider hiring you, that's what goes here. 
Maybe it's worded a little differently because it's on a resume and you're not using first person I statements, but you're essentially summarizing your elevator pitch for why you would be really strong at that job using this type of formatting. That's what I would challenge someone to think about it that way. And you're right. It's hard to get it right. It takes some time. You have to kind of think on it a little, but I would also reassure you that the rest of this starts to come really easy. So if you're sitting there right now, like this stinks. This is why I'm just going to stay in this job I hate, or this is why I just want someone to do it for me, even though maybe I don't have the money for it. it it's going to get easier from here. So I can assure you, like, take a, take a couple of rounds at it. Do your best crack at it. Have some friends or family look it over. I know the Madison Public Libraries offer free resume reviews. So if you double check their site, there's some folks that volunteer just to do this. Like, just start asking for feedback from your network and you'll slowly get there. It's kind of like, you know, uh, a painting. You may not get it all in one sitting. So just take some time with it because it's the best time you can spend. Um, so hopefully that helps kind of answer that one. I know it's it's easier said than done, right? All of this is, or and we, we do wouldn't have, have this today. Question. Yeah. <laughs> another question is, what if your accomplishments are not necessarily tied to what you want to do? Mm, interesting. Can they provide a little more detail there? Like what's their background and where are they trying to go? And then maybe I can better help answer it. That was my question. It's more of having a marketing background and mm -hmm. starting to get into operations and would like to continue down the operations path. Of the marketing things you've done, which ones have more of the operations components, if any? Do you have some there? Yeah. or that required operation skills in order to like get the accomplishments? Yes. I would focus your bullets on those. So I would reframe the things you did in marketing and think about, let's say your marketing like improved marketing share by 10%. Well, maybe operations won't care about that, but maybe you reviewed vendor contracts and saved 25% and decreased like, team hours by five hours. Let's say those were the sort of things they wanted in operations. Focus your bullets on those versus what you did in marketing. Does that help? Yes, I was just trying to tie together past and future like you were talking about, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In those cases, try to have all of your bullets be relevant to operations, and if anything, in that top section, you could always have some really like awesome marketing ones that you're just like, I know this is going to show I'm a rock star and like they'll be impressed. But then you can always later on in the um, work history focus more on operations. But that said, you definitely want operations on the top part too. So I know that we have conflicted some of the stuff I just said, but just keep that in mind. So I hope that helps. We can always circle back on that um, at the end too. So um, let's go ahead and move on to the professional experience. So we'll refer back to the resume cheat sheet um, for some ways to stand out there. And I'll give you a little bit of time to look at that. Um, key is that bullets are absolutely mandatory. If you write all of this in paragraph format, nobody can read it. It doesn't make sense. Just, just please don't. Um, don't be afraid to use sub bullets, especially on things that really stand out. That can be super helpful. And numbers. I love numbers. Numbers are key. You want them ideally on almost every bullet, um, no matter what type of role. And a lot of times I recommend that numbers provide context. So if you had something like I was, you know, an administrative assistant and you just like listed job description duties, that wouldn't stand out as much on um, something like, you know, point like, let's say administrative assistant for a team of 10 attorneys supporting 30 other staff members. Do you see how context there suddenly makes a difference? Um, you can do that also in terms of like revenue or department size or anything that provides a little background in terms of like, this was a lot of work and there was a lot of moving pieces. Highlight that with your numbers and really think about what did you rock in each role? Like, I don't really care what your job description says. I care like what did you do really well at? Um, those are the sort of things you want to focus on. And I have a free job search guide on my website. So you can go there and take a look at this. Um, you'll hear a lot of resume writers or career coaches talk about the PAR approach. 
And that is to think about your jobs and think about the problems that you encountered, the actions you took to help solve them and what the end results were. Similarly, you'll hear that with interview prep. They'll talk about, I think they call it STAR when it's interview. It's like, what's the situation? What's the task I did? What action did I do? And what was the result? If you Google either PAR or STAR, um, they have kind of a similar concept, but it's getting at identifying what types of things have you done? How did you manage it or overcome it? And what was the end result? My guide will walk through kind of a, a visual for how to do that in each of your past roles. And that can be a really helpful exercise to do to not only write your resume, but to prepare for interviews as well. Um, so I wanna go back to some of our examples um, to kind of show you for experience. So on this resume cheat sheet, here are different things you can do to really make your professional section stand out. A key is to describe the company in detail, especially if it's a small company and maybe people haven't heard of it, or maybe you were looking to switch industries or something and they just wouldn't be as familiar. It's helpful to let them know how many people work there. What was their revenue? Um, how much growth did they have while you were there? Think about things that you're like, because of this, it was just crazy to work there then. Like we had so much growth or we went you know, from paper-based to being completely in the cloud for 2000 people. Like whatever it is that you experienced or oftentimes where the turmoil or like challenges were, those are some things that you can actually spin in a really good way to stand out on your resume. You can describe the role in high level detail. I'm talking like two, three sentences max um, because you wanna really focus more on the bullets. A good thing would be, who did you report to? If you reported to like a pretty senior level position or like right to the president, CEO, something like that, that can be really helpful to have in there. Did you oversee anybody? Definitely want to have that in there. And just what other brag factors do you have? I remember one time I had a position where I had only been there two and a half years and I was the longest ter like tenured member of that department because we had about like 90% turnover. It was insane. Something like that is something that you can have on here. And it, it speaks to like the types of chaos that you went through while working there. Um, so think about allowing the reader to be impressed by like what kind of team you were part of. And you can feel free to use bolds or italics in here, but ultimately this like initial section, you really don't want more than three or four sentences or you're, you're starting to kind of violate the paragraph rule. And then you can get into bullets and you can see how fast and easy bullets are to read. Um, I tend to tell people go in order of priority, and this is kind of for everything in your resume, put the most important things first and then kind of the least important towards the bottom. So your single most important accomplishment there would go here, number one. But that said, based on the position you're applying to, so maybe you're switching from marketing to operations, you would not want your top marketing accomplishment to go first. You'd want the top operational related one to go first. And then don't be afraid to use sub bullets and also don't be afraid to bold things. I oftentimes like to bold anything involving a number. There's some old advice that anything like less than the number 10 that you're supposed to spell out. I totally disagree with that. List all numbers as numbers. They stand out on paper. You can see even just down here how this five to eight seconds stands out compared to all of the other wording. It just helps you so much. So get as many numbers in there as you can and list them as numbers. You do not need to write them out. Um, you wanna make sure the reader can skim quickly and maybe your job isn't that fancy. Some of the stuff sounds like so easy. And I always joke, like my kids do lawn mowing in our neighborhood. I could make them look awesome on paper. How would I do that? Talk about things like service five accounts grew accounts by 20% year over year. They added one house. You go from like five to six. I don't know what the percentage is offhand. Don't lie. Do not like completely get crazy here. But like if you worked at McDonald's, how many customers did you serve on an average ship shift? How many burgers did you flip? If you worked in reception, like how many calls did you take? Now, for those of you who may be, let's say, re-entering the workforce after a gap, you can think about having your summary section and then jumping right to community involvement or volunteer experience and even listing and treating them just like you would a company. 
Maybe you list the school name, maybe you call yourself a volunteer. You can do all of the same things with bullets. My one thing I recommend though, is you make it very clear up here, it's community involvement or volunteer work, or somehow make sure you highlight that it's non-paid so that it doesn't look like you're trying to market this unpaid work for paid. I've had some folks challenge me on that saying, why, why should it make a difference? It just does. When you're an employee, there's certain things that occur between the employee and employer relationship and hiring managers and recruiters get that. And so if they see a resume where they feel like someone's misrepresenting too much stuff they did with non-paid work, there just will be some trust factors that could be broken there. But if you did something like this and just did community involvement, and maybe you made it clear like non-paid or unpaid volunteer, because sometimes there's ones where people are like, some of this was paid like playground supervisor or lunch duty, some of it wasn't like, how do I do all of that? You can get creative with that, but you can still have bullets like supervise 200 kids over, you know, three different lunch shifts. Those are all ways to get some numbers on there to help stand out. Um, some other examples, like if you created a checklist, a process or a training program, include those sort of things. How many pages were they? Um, how many different people benefited from it? Did they roll it out company wide because you implemented this thing that saved time? Did you help make things more efficient? Um, something as simple as like revamped a customer service process and saved administrative time by 20%. Those are really great things to have in there and they can really help you stand out. And just don't go overboard with the special checks. Like if every single section has one, it's just not really as helpful. So I wanna kind of go back to one of these word examples to show you on here is a great visual. You know, they did it a little different. They've got things formatted a little differently, but it still kind of gets into some of that paragraph format we just talked about. This would be a great area to add the company description, the history, a little bit about kind of your duties in the sentence format. Here they give you a way to showcase like your most significant accomplishment, and then it gets right into the results. So there's lots of different ways to visually showcase this, but you can see some of the themes start to come together. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back to this one. And so I recommend if you're struggling for the content to provide within these um, sections, whether it's professional or volunteer, go back to my job search guide and take a look there. And that should give you some um, inspiration for things to look for. So we're getting to the last slide. So we should have some um, solid amount of time left to go over all of these questions. And so some things I wanna provide, I mentioned in the very beginning about applicant tracking systems and keywords and all of these things. There are two websites that I can recommend, and I know there's more out there. These are just the two that I think popped up on Google first, and so I use them. Um, these sites, skillsinker.com and jobscan.com, will let you upload a job description, upload your existing resume, and it will give you a keyword score. So let's say you were applying to operations jobs. It would let you you know, put in the operations job description, your new updated resume, and maybe it gives you a keyword score of like 39 and you're super lacking in the things this employer is looking for. These sites will actually provide um, artificial intelligence coaching to help you improve that score. So I really recommend them. I don't like, especially when you're new to this, once you do it a few times, you'll get a feel for how to tweak things. And I think there was a question early on, like, how do I tweak this for each position I apply to? How do I know what they're looking for? I would say do this exercise until you get used to it. Once you do it, depends on the person, like three, four times for other people, it may take a little longer. But once you do it a couple of times, you'll start to get a feel for okay, this is what they're looking for. This is how I have to visually showcase it. And you'll start learning how to do some of those tweaks on your own pretty quick. But once you do that, you'll see your score go up from like a 39, for example, to an 88. Once you get a higher score, you start to get more interview requests. Sometimes folks spend too much time on this piece and it's not worthwhile. I would say it's far better for your time to be out there networking, talking with folks and things like that than it is to obsess over your resume score. But it's helpful to do and it's helpful to be aware of. So these sites will help you do that. I think they each let you do three for free. 
And what I've recommended is like Google the other ones, like almost all of them let you do three for free. So once you've done it like 10, 12 times, you'll know whether or not it's worth it for you to have a paid subscription. And I think it's like 10 bucks a month, um, but at a minimum, try the free ones. My other advice is if you do land an interview, upload the job description, upload your resume and use this keyword um, coaching to remind yourself what to talk about in the interview and what types of keywords to use or what types of things to talk about the most. Because like, for instance, you would want your interview answers to be more focused on pivoting into operations than talking about all of your marketing stuff because that'll help land um, more offers. So we will open it up to questions. Um, again, on my website, I have a free job search guide. I have a free resume course. So if all of this stuff still feels like super overwhelming and you're not sure, take a look at that course, it's free. I have a couple of free job search groups coming up. Um, I give a lot of information out on LinkedIn, so definitely feel free um, to reach out to me there. But I'm gonna open this up to the questions and let um, Kara, if you don't mind, kind of moderate those and we'll see what we can fit in so that we still end on time. So, okay, thank you. To get started, the two resume um, websites that you referred to earlier in the presentation, are those free or are those um, pay for the template? So Live Career gives you, I think, up to three for free. And a tip there is if you use different email addresses, you can maybe get a few more. Um, the Distinctive Career website, I think that's the name of it, theirs average about $25 to $27 each, so they're not free because hers is like completely a business, and I don't think she gives any samples for free. You can sometimes get cheaper ones on Etsy, but they're not, I don't think they're as user-friendly, but I definitely recommend Live Career um, for free, and Microsoft Word has some good free templates too. Um, I just prefer the other two, so hope that helps. Yeah, next question is how important are exact dates? I worked overseas and volunteered here and there, but didn't quite keep tabs on when I started and stopped. I would use years. I wouldn't worry about months. And I usually tell most people that just because I think it reads nicer on paper. And as long as you're not trying to like showcase yourself for being somewhere 10 years versus like you were there six months <laughs> or something like shady, you're fine. Okay, I think we're up to date with the questions. If I miss something in the chat, um, go ahead and type it in again. Um, or if you have other questions, go ahead and type those in. Is there still a rule for length of resumes? Some people say there is. Um, Basically, you tend to go back about 10, maybe 15 years if it makes sense from a layout perspective. And you'll often see once you kind of go back more than even two to five years, it probably gets onto two pages. It's more about do you have the right content to use versus the like I could have a college student with a two page one if it was all super relevant. Like let's say they had a co-op and three internships and they had this great summary section and they had some really good project work in their courses. Like if they made it work and it was relevant to the positions and it was a page and a half, I wouldn't cut it just to fit a page. It's more about what's relevant towards where you're going and is it like helpful? Like if you include a bunch of stuff from 25 years ago, no. And I would avoid doing that anyhow for age bias reasons, try to focus on the last 10 to 15 years. A little tip I have there, um, I want to bring this up to kind of show you what I mean. Let's say you have things and you're like, well, that's great, Nikki. All of my good stuff is from like 15 years ago. If you go on one of these templates, I would recommend creating, for instance, like a, a new section. I'm just using this one as an example, but you can copy and paste the section and do something like uh, let's just say additional history, you could do something like that and you could list the things, but leave the dates off. So that's the rule of thumb that I do when people need to do something like that. And they're like, well, that doesn't really help me. So I hope um, it, that should answer that question. Yeah. Um, do you, st a couple questions about um, job gaps. Do you still list a job or have a job gap if you have been in the workforce over 15 years? 
If they're doing their resume in like some type of chronological order and there was a gap, just let the gap be there. You don't like okay. need to draw attention to it. You don't need to put a placeholder for something like, oh, you know, I was a stay at home mom or this and that. Most people don't really question gaps anymore. And if you have one now, like let's say you're unemployed for various reasons, then sometimes you need to address it in some type of format, either through your summary or somehow like you're putting, you know, after, after a break, looking to reenter the workforce, you don't really need to get into why or any of that information, but you do need to address it because they're wondering. And same if your position, like if it was due to budget cuts or layoffs or things like that, I recommend getting that right out there if you were not let go for cause. Because if you, that's the first thing they're usually wondering about is like, oh, were they fired for like bad performance type of thing? And then even if you were, there's some creative ways you can try to address that. Like, you know, position was eliminated um, due to budgets or fit, or there's usually something you can kind of come up with where like, I don't know, you address that. You never want to lie. Like you don't want to say it was a layoff if it was for performance, but that's where in your summary section, you could focus more on like, you know, excited to pursue a position in sales or something. Um, those can get kind of case by case, but I hope that addresses the gap question. I think you addressed this one, um, which was what are your best tips for large gaps in your resume? In that case, yeah, I would start with your summary section and focus on the skills that were relevant. And then rather than having employment next, I would have your community and or volunteer experience listed and then do your professional experience. And if you're worried about an age bias, which could happen with a large gap, you could do like work experience and just leave the dates off because they'll read between the lines. Like, let's say all of your volunteer experience focuses on dates within the last 10 years. They'll figure out pretty quickly your work experience was older than 10 years ago, but they don't need to know it was 20, 30, you know, however many years ago. So it's just a matter of formatting it differently. Um, and if you don't have any community experience to use, you could do your summary and then you could do like coursework and you could talk about like different courses you've taken on LinkedIn, certifications you've done. And there's a ton of free ones out there. So you can list things like that. Maybe you took some free courses on QuickBooks or something. Then you could either do your volunteer experience or get right into past work history. Um, Cause not everyone has the volunteer stuff. I get that. Um, but there's usually something you can kind of do there to stand out in a way without just, you know, drawing attention to it. Um, so that should help with that. Another question here is where does education go for the a seasoned employees? For the which employees? Seasoned. <laughs> season. Oh, I would put it at the end. Oftentimes I either do it last or second to last. Um, I'll do like summary work experience. I typically do community involvement after that and then end on education. But if the education's super vital, like if it's accounting or law or where like you need to have that degree, I'll do professional experience, the degree, then get into the community involvement. Sometimes you'll even see people still put like key areas of talent and expertise at the very end, or you could even have some testimonials at the end. But education is definitely in like the bottom one third for what it's worth. If you're a new grad, have it at the top, but only if you don't have a lot of internship experience. If you have some decent like part-time jobs or internship experience, I would still put those before your education because it still comes down to work experience and there it could help set you up for a job that maybe they want one to three years experience and they'll take your part-time like job that you did while you were in college and count it towards that. So don't discredit yourself there. That kind of goes both ways, so. Uh, another question here, what about short-term jobs or volunteer positions? Um, that are short because of moving, um, prior military moves. What mm -hmm. is the best way to address that so it doesn't appear that I am a high turnover employee? I would, oh boy. Um, I feel like this one, um, I'm gonna answer it as best I can, but I want her to contact me after this because of the military experience. I will provide like 
customized free advice to her just because thank you for your service and thank you for the sacrifices your family made. Um, we really appreciate it. I would probably focus, I'd, I'd probably be pretty a little more honest in the summary section and say something like, you know, um, returning to the workforce after 20 years of supporting a military family, um, something I'd get creative with that writing somehow without, you don't always want to draw attention to the kids and all of that, and yada, yada. I'm pretty careful about not trying to give out any personal information, but something like that. I've done that with trailing spouses, like, you know, returning after trailing a spouse or have with military stuff. So I'd focus that in the summary. And then instead of, I would maybe do volunteer stuff first because then the dates don't matter as much um, because nobody really gets too mad if like a volunteer thing was shorter. And then maybe um, even call it like short-term work experience somehow with your sections. I would separate those two and I would draw attention to the fact that they were intentionally short term, like due to the military stuff. So it'd all be themed together. I know that probably sounds like a convoluted answer, but we'd have to get your stuff down on paper and get very intentional with how we describe you in the summary. And then the layout, um, I would recommend starting with community involvement and then doing work history and we can definitely make that look really strong and make the short term nature look strong due to the, the military family. That would be my advice there versus having this clunky thing where you combine the two and it's like, I was here two months, did this a month. Like, I wouldn't do it as much chronological. I'd be very intentional with our branding of the headings and kind of how we make it flow. I hope that helps there. There's a lot of freedom that you have with this stuff. And so we, we use it to the best of your ability. I know I could do it. I'm probably sounding rambling. It's one of those, like, I can see it in my head and I know you can't see what I'm trying to describe right now, but we can do it. <laughs> I think, I think you made sense. I think. Okay, you good. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? We have time for maybe one more question. All right. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. Oh, oh, that was a thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions there. So just a moment here. 